Hi, I'm Jameson Newlander, Alan Frog from The Lost Boys, and you're watching the Frog Brothers Podcast. Let me get a it's refreshment time, folks. I'm just going to go watch a movie. Do you like scary movies? I don't watch movies. I have to return some videotapes. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. I don't need a TV. Books, records, films, these things matter. Call me shallow. It's the fucking truth. Over 1,600 titles. Each for rent at just $2 the first night and only a... TV. Yeah, but you are aware that there's an invention called television, and on this invention they show shows, right? It's a laser disc. Okay, I want channels 18, 24, 63, 987, and Welcome to the Fog Brothers Podcast with your hosts, Justin and Alec. Hello, and welcome to episode 69 of the Frog Brothers Podcast. 69, dudes. Sorry, I didn't get a sound clip of that. I figured I could just do it myself. Yeah, I figured that's kind of what we're going for. Um, got some news this week. Yeah, there's a lots of lots of good stuff going on in the world. You what do you have to... down for news? Well, you go ahead and drop yours, man. You got your list there. You're ready to go. I just got um, some purchases. Uh, Crypticon's coming up. I figured we'd talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll yeah. get into that a little bit more in a minute, I guess. Uh, so we saw Black Widow, uh, episode five of Loki. It's about all the news I got. I don't, I don't really, really recall much more than that. <laughs> the other big news was that uh, the new Resident Evil show dropped on Netflix, so we're going to start going through that here. Um, that's the kind of show we'll probably just do in like a, a, a single season recap on an episode. So give everyone a chance to watch that. We're going to plan for that for, I think, two weeks out we'll try for. That way we get a chance to watch it and just kind of cover it all at once. You know, those short seasons on Netflix, it's easy because it's easy to binge watch. Yeah. So it's not like the Disney Plus where you got to wait week by week. So we don't want to do an episode by episode for something like that. So we're just going to just cover that whole season at once. So that's uh, that dropped on Thursday last week. There's a bunch of other stuff that dropped on Netflix too. Depends on like what other kinds of shows you're into. Like the show Atypical, I've kind of been a fan of, enjoyed. Mm. It finally has its fourth and final season's release, so I need to get into that and check it out too. So, uh, just got reminded that the uh, Evil Dead 40th anniversary is this fall, so we will be looking forward to that, which is wild to think. Like that movie came out several years before i was born so mm. uh excited to see what you know how that's holding up to the modern legacy and everything else yeah and news wise um uh, we're really kind of in a news lull mostly because san diego comic-con's getting ready to happen in a mostly kind of a virtual setting i think it's going to be a hybrid or something this year but it seems like a lot of places have online events and stuff like that so yeah neck is doing a some sort of online panel so we'll probably do some sort of coverage of that even if it's just sort of like a nightly recap or something yeah so there's gonna be a lot of stuff like that so everyone's kind of in a news lull right now the good news is though that um black widow did very well at the um, box office over the weekend i think it said 80 million is what i read this morning hmm. on hmm. in the box office and like another 60 million in um disney plus sales so um we're uh, doing uh, there it is it. With it doing that well on the Disney Plus, I don't know if they'll continue to do hybrid openings. Um, I I could see them doing that selectively based on the movie and based on the time of year you're in. So yeah. So that's interesting to see. For sure. Uh, Ghostbusters has released a few more images of uh, afterlife stuff. Just nothing, nothing like really earth shaking. But the one that came out is uh, Mr. Gruberson. Um, with the mama bear. I don't know if we, what's her name? Callie. Is that it? Uh, is it? I'm trying to remember what her name is. Yeah, we're asking the wrong guy because I'm super high. That's your secret, Cap. You're always high. Exactly. Uh, no, so, and, but the cool thing about that is they finally showed that poster off 
that came with uh, those Reebok shoes. It was kind of like wrapped up on the tissue paper there. So like we got a, um, you know, kind of a image of that. So you can kind of see what's going on with it. And the cool thing on that is that there's this badass vintage looking TV that Alec has one that our dad bought when he was stationed in Japan, when he was in the Navy, like way back in the day. So yeah. Um, before RCA cables were a thing before yeah. coax. Well, I'm sure coax was around, but uh, it does not have coax. There's no inputs on that at all, right? That's just over there. No, it's it has inputs, but they're like those old ones where you have to screw them in with a screwdriver and like wrap the cable around it. I don't know exactly what that's called. I have to research it to get into that. I know what you're talking about. Way to connect it, because so, I want to be able to like stack a bunch of a couple TVs in a corner and have them all playing the same VHS with a switcher, you know? Yes, that'd be pretty slick, especially in that video store setup. Totally jealous of that. Yeah. I had to try to fancy myself up tonight, so I threw on this uh, camo shirt that you see Edgar Frog wear in uh, some scenes in The Lost Boys. So, I'm wearing the classic It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia shirt uh, that Mac wears with a mm -hmm. beer on it. Yes, the beer, deer, antler beer. Exactly. It's amazing. Well, I guess I'll go through some of these purchases. And uh, something else that's not quite a purchase because I didn't buy it, but someone sent it to me and uh, a friend who knew I was an ALF fan. Yeah, show it off. I have received the ALF cake pan. Let me not blind you with that. Yes, I have one of those too. It's amazing. Got the little face thing. So when you make cake, put the face on it. I don't have that piece. But I will tell you this right now, and I'm just going to announce this right here. Alec and I are going to do a special YouTube episode sometime in the rest of this year where we are going to do a cake, ALF cake decorating competition where we're each going to bake an ALF cake and decorate it since we each have the, the, the cake pan. And then I'll also probably record bits with me uh, dressed as uh, Gordon Ramsay yelling at us. Yes. Verbally abusing us. Yes, intercut it there. Actually, I bet we could just rip audio of him selling, yelling at somebody else anyway and just apply yeah. it to our show. So I so, uh, also happened to pick up a Super Soaker XP30. It's pretty sweet. Listen to that. A little air pump action. And listen, listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty slick. Uh, I love it. It's nostalgic as hell, and it just has to go in this room and in my house in general as a decoration. And plus, I can use it to spray the cats if they're doing bad shit. And if you think that's abusive, you should see the scar on my head that my cat left. Yeah, his cat left. Had him required to get staples. Speaking of water guns, my uh, Uzi squirt gun for my Alan Frog cosplay came in. Quiet and joy. Yes. This Pretty good. It does out. work, um, but it's not motorized, but it does have the top water tank with the white on the top, which is the kind that he has. It doesn't have this on his model, but I don't care. Uh, I kind of like it on there. That way I don't get shot. What else do you have over there? I have quite a bit. This was uh, a week. I have a, a trapper keeper I bought to keep notes in. And I threw uh, a yeah. Rock Brothers sticker on it. Me, the company that makes those, liked our Instagram post on that earlier. I saw it's cracking me up. That's awesome because I hashtagged it Trapper Keeper. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're looking for that right now. So that's a great one. The Mighty Morphin Power Rangers box set is that Blu ray? It's not. Oh, okay. Um, Why the fuck did blue trim all over it then? That's kind of asinine, right? It says Saban Power Rangers 20. So it must be like the 20 year box set it has a bunch of bonus features, but it does have season one, season two, season three, and Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers. So, oh, damn. So that's Shout Factory DVD. Yeah. There's 60 episodes in the first season. There's like, I want to say 40 or something in the second one. I'll tell you right now. All 52 episodes of season two. And then all 33 of the. One where they're dressed like ninjas and the alien rangers. So that's pretty slick. Saw it at Walmart and was like, oh, that's an impulse buy. 
Yeah, well, sometimes the best buys are impulse buys, right? I also stopped at Goodwill this week just to try to find an Edgar or uh, Alan Frog uh, shirt to wear for cosplay, but I could not find one. But I did find a couple little things here. Uh, 13 Ghosts DVD. Hell yeah. That's a classic. Yeah, I have it on. I actually had it on VHS, but I didn't have the DVD. So I was like, eh, I'll pick that up on DVD. They had a, uh, I found a Scooby Doo children's book from Cartoon Network. Awesome. That's a fun old uh, scholastic 90s book. Hell yeah. And then, uh, also picked up a copy of the uh, 98 Godzilla on DVD because I, for some reason, couldn't find the copy that I had. So it's like, eh, it's cheap enough. I'll buy another copy. Yeah, it's not great, but it's worth having if you're a fan of Godzilla, right? You got to have it in the collection. It, it was in the collection as well as just it's, uh, it's entertaining. I mean, yeah. That's pretty. That's everything this week. That was a haul. So my washing machine decided to die on me. So I haven't really done anything too crazy. And since I'm uh, yeah. trying, to, trying to move and in the process of that whole piece, like I didn't want to buy a full new washing. So I bought a hand crank portable washing machine. It's made for like camping and small apartments and stuff. So I'm going to try to ride that out until I. Uh... So that was one of my exciting purchases this month this week and then, i'm just going to take that clip of you saying that and in the camo shirt it'll, and i'll just like add some other right wing things in the background and you'll look like you're like a, a right wing podcaster i mean all you got to do is go watch our trump special so we've already put that out there in the world we don't need to do an episode two of that yeehaw uh i also got my water gun in i got vintage laramie water gun um uh, nice and dirty now it's triggers broken and it's missing uh, the battery compartment but you know what don't really care it's for cosplay um if it was in pristine shape i'd be much more worried about it but this thing's just kind of been sitting around in the garage the screws are all rusted mm. the main thing it had that i wanted was the uh the water clip that slides in and out so and then to Alex point, I am going to have to tape or do something about putting an orange tip on here because uh, I don't really want to get fucking mowed down for cosplaying a character that's using a water gun in a movie. So right. I'm going to have to mod that. So it'll be what it is. I mean, safer that way, better for everybody involved. So mm -hmm. you know not... how much I sacrificed! Exactly. So if you know anybody selling a battery compartment, I'd definitely be interested in one of those. But beyond that, I'm really not even that worried about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> excuse me and then i've got a water canteen that's pretty close the one that he wears in the movie the stripe there's a stripe in it so i've got a striped um well actually it's over there at your place it's the hard case for the uh soundboard it's actually got a black and red striped mm -hmm thing for it so i might i might take that and put it on here so it just matches a little bit better yeah fun fun but i mean before we jump into news we only had one movie this week we were supposed to have craig from white chest podcast on to discuss ghost heads for its anniversary we will actually be doing that next week craig had some things come up so we're just kind of being adaptable on the fly and since we had um really the first convention since things have really kind of started opening back up, at least here in town for us, getting ready to happen. Uh, Fucking A, man. We're going to talk a little bit about Crypticon Kansas City and yeah, the guests that we're going to be looking forward to seeing this weekend. So if you're in the Kansas City area, Crypticon runs Friday through Sunday this year. Um, Midland Empire Ghostbusters are always part of that, and obviously we're, we're part of that group, so we'll be out there. Um, I'm only going to be able to go Friday this year just because uh, as, a, as a parent, I've got other obligations going on, but it's going to be pretty excellent getting out there together with Alec. We're going to debut a Frog Rose Ghostbusters mashup cosplay at this event. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty stoked on it. I mean, it's just one of those things that came together pretty easily. And uh, pretty good. Uh, as we started putting this together, we realized like we really just need to get the other 
uh, cosplays going as well. So it's pretty straightforward to to do those. So you know, we hit yeah. the military plus a couple weekends ago. Did a little bit of that. I've ordered a few things online. Tried and failed a few times to get what I was looking for. Ordered a green vest that Edgar's wearing and totally didn't even catch that it was like a lady style jacket and a lady size. So luckily I gave that to my lady friend and it fits her perfect because I looked like I was wearing someone else's clothes because it didn't fit. That's fun though. Don't you like the thrill of wearing another man's skin? Feeling yeah. how he feels. I mean, I, I took a chance to not totally clammy when you do that, but shitting in the toilet that he usually shits in. Oh, well, that's a little extreme. I mean, there's just some lines you can't cross. Wearing someone's skin? Eh. <laughs> I'd be like wearing a leather jacket and then going and shitting in the pasture by another cow. <laughs> um, so what have you got thrown together for your uh, Edgar or your Alan Frog cosplay? Because you've been working on it. We haven't really been overlapping a lot. You know, I mean, we went and perused through the... Uh, the store but what'd you get on what's all what's yours entail for your main get up um i'm just gonna for now have to go with the plain white t-shirt before i can moving forward i'm gonna redesign the design that he has on his and photoshop i'm just gonna redo it we'll probably even maybe throw that up on our uh shirt store for a limited time or something the uh alan frog shirt design um but i'm gonna have to redesign that and print it for my outfit so I'll just go with a white t-shirt because he does wear that earlier in the film. Uh, I need dog tags still is the problem. And I need a knife for my belt. But the thing is, I can kind of swap out the knife for a PKA meter too. Yeah, for the mashup, it's going to be easier to get away with a few things here. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that that'll for that first round here is is the mashup will be good, and then by the time we debut just the regular Frog Brothers cosplay at Planet Comic Con in Kansas City next month, uh, we'll have all that stuff lined out and ready to go. So yeah. it'll be pretty slick. And so we've already got the Ghostbusters logo style Frog Bros. It just says Frog is the last name name tapes, and then I got actual military style ones for the other ones. So. Yeah. Uh, kind of a visual prompt in case anyone doesn't know it's there but it's actually in some of the sequels that you see edgar having that on his stuff so it's in canon with the movies but there's a lot of wankers out there they're like well the other movies aren't canon and you're like yeah the second one's like kind of dull the third one's pretty fun so um definitely enjoy those and anytime you get those characters on they're like you're gonna give me the frog brothers in a movie i'm gonna fucking watch it yeah right. the thing is the third one's technically like a very frog brothers centric movie and the second one edgar's in there but it's he's just not in there as much and it's still just a plot I see why people really don't like the second one because in comparison it does pale but the third one picks it back up and you know what whatever so it's, it's a new story idea the the second one is basically just too much of a beat for beat remake almost of sorts right and it just doesn't doesn't hold up the same yeah and it's not because it's like terrible i mean the action seeking scenes are fun and everything it just it just they didn't need to tell that story again so yeah so let's talk crypticon man let's jump into it we don't have any segment music for this but uh if you're in the kansas city area and they do crypticon in a couple other spots i don't they do uh, minneapolis crypticon so if you're up in the twin cities there that's pretty cool too and so maybe someday we'll go check out some of these other ones um but d wallace is uh, one of the guests she'll be there she was an et cujo the howling critters so Pretty awesome. We got Billy Zane, the man himself, the movie The Phantom, Titanic, Demon Knight, Back to the Future 2. Twin Peaks. Yes. I'm thinking about having him sign something Twin Peaksy. I don't know what that I have, but I don't know. And then Bonnie Ahrens, um, she's actually a recognizer. I think she was the nun in the movie The Nun, The Conjuring 2, Annabelle Creation, Drag Me to Hell, she was also in. So um, I mean, this is a horror-themed con, so it's it's got some excellent guests. Uh, Dana De Lorenzo, obviously you recognize her from Ash vs. the Evil Dead, um, for our crowd anyway. Some people say The Mad Ones and Will and Grace and Harold and Kumar Christmas. So if you know her, you Ash vs. Evil Dead and maybe the Harold and Kumar Christmas movie. Yeah, I've seen her. Ones. She's also in an episode of Workaholics. Yep. Yeah, she's awesome in Ash vs. Evil Dead, and then uh, she's actually going to be featured in the new uh, Ash vs. Evil, well, the new... Uh, 
um, Evil Dead video game, they're calling it, I guess. So, yeah, which is pretty awesome. You got a little variety there. So, Jason Douglas. So, We Are the Walking Dead, Dragon Ball Z, Drop D, Preacher. Not too familiar with his work. Um, he's in Dragon Ball Z, and that makes me wonder what he does on that. But that's the that's Dragon Ball Super. So, that's probably, I'm not sure who he voices. Probably a newer character, maybe. Gotcha. Just kind of going through the list, Christina Kleb or Kleb, I don't know how you say her last name, so sorry if I butchered it. Um, she's was in the Hellboy movie, the remake, the uh, DK Harbor version of that. She's also in the uh, looks like the reboot Halloween series, Tales of Halloween, Professor T. So just kind of the horror movie, B movie genre. So yeah, that's fun stuff. Some dude named Drew Fortier plays a guitar in his little photo there he's been in some dwellers <laughs> rock star hitman krista and something else so again not familiar with his work but if you're deeper into some of the horror than we are then you'll definitely appreciate that cj graham from friday the 13th i can't part tell what six. part six awesome yeah you can tell by the mask he's holding uh good call good call the uh, highway to hell and then uh vengeance you know, and that, these are just some of the highlights that the Crypticon itself has called out. Scout Taylor Compton was in the Halloween reboot, Halloween 2, The Runaways. So obviously, if you're a fan of Joan Jett, that's like the movie about her backstory. So you probably recognize her from that. And then uh, Wicked Little Things. And then we got the Beast, and Tyler Main, who's in uh, X-Men. Uh, is also in the... Uh, Rob Zombie Halloween and Halloween 2, and then the movie Troy. So, lots of stuff. He played, uh, what's his name in uh, the X Men movie, right? Um, Beast. Or yeah. not Beast, uh, fucking Sabretooth. Yeah, Sabretooth, which is crazy because they wind up recasting him in X Men Origins with uh, Leap Schreiber. Yeah, and I thought, I don't know, I thought that they, this guy had the better physicality for the character, but that's just me. Oh, yeah. V. Neal, who's a special effects artist. She's done some awesome stuff. She did Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the coolest Ted's Prevail, Face Off, Battle Royale. So uh, that'll be awesome to see a professional makeup artist doing stuff there. And Terry Kaiser, I know this is one of Alex's fucking musts for the list. Fucking right. Bernie. Weekend at Bernie's. Let's say that again. A weekend at Bernie's. Now that's some shit right there. Oh yeah, that's awesome. And even uh, Friday the Thirteenth. I can't remember which one that is. Oh, that's part seven. Uh, the the new blood. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not super knowledgeable on the Friday the Thirteenth. I my knowledge is limited, but uh, I do remember him being in that one. Lisa Zane. Yeah. And she's in Monkey Bone, yeah, but... which I've been wanting to cover. And uh, she's on Freddy's Dead as well. Yeah, and the nurse and Dinotopia, which I guess I never even realized they did a, an adaptation of Dinotopia, so I might have to look into that. And then we've got Phil Fonda Caro, who was in Willow, Return of the Jedi, Land of the Dead, and Troll. Oh, I remember him in Land of the Dead. I actually uh, watched that recently. That's awesome. He's a short fellow. Yep. Yeah, so that's fun. They've got they've got a good variety of guests on here. And then Zach Galligan, man, fucking Gremlins. We're that's huge. another must for me. Yeah, Gremlins, Gremlins 2, Waxwork, Hatchet. But, I mean, the Gremlins titles alone are just like, okay. Hell yeah, that'll be awesome. Vinny Appis of uh, Dio. And Sabbath. Yeah, and Sabbath. So... Uh, this this fest, you know, this uh, Crypticon, they they had some of these like kind of musician guests and stuff on there too. So Walter Phelan, I guess, is another visual effects artist. Um, I'm assuming more in the makeup and actual um, creature effects. So House of a Thousand Corpses, Demon Knight, one of my personal favorites from Dust Till Dawn. So there's there's some really cool stuff going on here. Denny Roth, who did Kong Skull Island. Um, this is Marshall Star, so it looks like an anime voice actor. So it's some good stuff there. Ali Garza, that's done some Vampirella works, comic book artist. So Superman, Thundercats, Red Sonia Chaos, 
So like there's a great mix here. And then uh, Baroness Von T cosplay. If you're in the cosplay scene, you may recognize her. Uh, one of our hometown friends here, Patrick Ria, who actually uh, works with some of our friends around town. So uh, he did the uh, local film I Am Lisa, which is a pretty good uh, kind of a wearable flick. I know you were uh, in contact working with him on a project recently. He also did Nailbiter, which is a, another one our friend Tony worked on with him. So Yeah, I was a PA on uh, the newest film that he just directed. It's going to probably come out next year. So it was cool to work yeah. with him. And then the Michael, Michael Bain. Bain. Michael yeah. Bean, Bain, Bine, I don't know how you say it. everyone say it, yeah. But Bean is the least appealing way to hear it because it makes it, I don't know, just I don't like it. So I refuse to I say it. I would want to be called Mr. Bean. There's a Mr. Bean out there that's like oddly comical. <laughs> but he's awesome. Fucking I just love the shit he's in. Planet Terror, The Mandalorian, which I'd love to see his character come back and do more in The Mandalorian. But Yeah. Oh. Jennifer Blanc Bean. He was also in Take Me Home Tonight. Yeah, that must be his wife, but she's in the night visitor. She rises to divide dark angels. So, Mark Ralston. Mark Ralston. Yeah, Aliens, Robocop 2, some of the Saw movies. I'm pretty sure he's in Rush Hour. Yeah. I'm mistaking him. but. And Danielle Bistuti. Curse of Chucky. Insidious. Yep. Insidious. <laughs> what? Insidious. What did I say? Insidious? Yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Old jacket, green jacket, who gives a shit? Vincent Dasani, who's done Never Hike Alone, which I believe was like one of the fan films Friday the 13th made. Never Hike in the Snow, Pathosis, Fanboy. Yeah, so he's kind of an independent filmmaker there, which is it's great to see a good mix of of this stuff here. Ken Sagos, is that how you say that? <laughs> Nightmare yeah. on Street 3, The Dream Warriors. Fuck yeah, son. He's in 4, too. Um I'm probably going to get his autograph. A little 8 by 10 probably. Hell yeah. And then Ross Marquand, if you're a fan of The Walking Dead, that's where you'll know him from. Obviously Mad Men. And then hopefully if you're paying attention, like I nerd out on this shit, but he uh, played the Red Skull in Avengers Infinity War. Um, basically they recast, uh, what was his name? Played him in the uh, first Avenger. So he, he did a great Hugo job. Hugo Weaving. Yeah, Hugo Weaving, so. Pretty awesome. Then Lisa Wilcox, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Nightmare on Elm Street 5. 5, okay. Star Trek, The Next Generation, The Bloody Man. Like So there's an excellent, excellent list of people here. And most of these, these people are scheduled last year are still coming back. So we've definitely got a – they're definitely going to get some money out of us this, this weekend. Oh, they already have a map too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then our group, the Midland Empire Ghostbusters, will have a, a booth set up, and I think we're gonna have one of the Ecto ones inside there. So drop by, check that stuff out. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good time. So if you see us, say hi. If you recognize us, just let us know. We've got business cards. We may may have some swag if you come up and recognize us. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a good time. So yeah, I don't know good. how many local listeners we have, but there well, there will be at least a few people who we run into that we know that probably don't listen to the podcast. But hey. If you yep, recognize but, us, we'll give you uh, some stickers or something. Yeah, come up and recognize us. Yeah, we've got we've got some goodies. So let's uh let's move along. Do you want to jump into the big the big blockbuster? I do. I gotta get through this. Unfortunately, I have a fucking migraine out the asshole right now. Okay. Well, I'm dying. Um. Yeah. Let's do water cooler cold. Loki. Yeah, Loki. So you just watched this tonight. What are your impressions? I watched this last Wednesday night when it came out. So uh, it's one of the better episodes. It's awesome. So we're in this phenomenon where like there's just random spoilers being leaked all over the place, which is kind of annoying, but it's not necessarily relevant. But we happen to be obviously if you're listening and you know us, you know, we nerd out on Ghostbusters and this episode had one of the Loki variants, the young guy, was drinking uh, an ecto cooler while sitting in the throne in the Loki's den that they have. So that was going around even before most people saw the episode. So you knew at some point in time that 
that was going to happen, which doesn't really do anything plot wise, but it's like, it's so weird seeing how modern culture is like spoiling stuff, but then not spoiling stuff. Right. It's just so hit or miss with like what people think is okay to do. Yeah. Like for a while, like with Mandalorian stuff got really bad. And then the first couple Marvel series, things were really bad. And then this show has been pretty quiet from at least on my feed, my social media feeds to see like what people are spoiling and talking about Mm -hmm. immediately without giving people a few days to kind of digest. So this right. episode was fun though man i think it was really i'm glad we got mobius back right you know i think he did a great job in this episode really kind of leading the way and mm-hmm. describing the philosophies of people and i like how his character has changed because he still feels like he's true to himself just as far as how he behaves and what he's doing but it's just his core belief system was shaken up so now he's still doing what he knows how to do to help people in a different way right yeah. so, so I, I, I like his uh his character a lot I like the alligator. He's one of my fucking favorites, man. Like when he bit off the president Loki's hand, so fucking awesome. And I just can't get enough of that. Like they're, you know, keep talking about the alligator and you're like, you know, there's so many memes and so many artwork pieces for that. I'm like, yeah, if Marvel yeah. legends doesn't give me a fucking alligator Loki. I'm going to be really fucking pissed. And I'll probably have to buy like a 3d printed one somewhere on Etsy or eBay, because you know, someone's going to make one. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Um, there was some. Int- I only have a couple notes on here, but the the kid killed Thor was his nexus event. That was kind of interesting. Yeah, well, that just gives more power to that character, right? And then I love the old man's redemption, right? You know, he's talking about him like we're all here because like all Loki's are cursed to just be fucks, and it's pretty crazy seeing like some of these Lokis that are here surviving, like still trying to decide to do the right thing because obviously the, the Loki that we all know and love um, has been there. So, Mm. Um, so you're a big fan. Um, I know one thing that James Gunn himself shared on there was the Thanos copter that you see in there. It's a reference to Spidey super stories, number 39 from 1979 taking on Thanos. So that's kind of crazy that, They've got some of these pieces in there. I love how they've got so many of those bits. Yeah. Yeah, that was the last note I had was the alligator Loki bites the other Loki's hand off the President Loki. The thing I've really enjoyed about this episode is Elioth. Um, It's just kind of like this omnipresent thing in there. It almost feels like a Stephen King villain. And in, in a certain way, like in a good way, I would say, right? Because you're like, what is this a living creature? What is it? And you're just starting to finally understand that at the end of the episode, you know, it's obviously a cliffhanger where they're able to work together, the two Lokis hand in hand, doubling down on their power to do things. And mm-hmm. then we see like, we see old man Loki, like give his, basically give his life to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I can for the cause. So I liked his care, uh, his story. And another fun thing that I, I saw on him, like on his social media that was pretty neat was, you know, he's talking about like, you know, my dad always like teased me or something about like dressing up in tights or something and like performing or whatever. And then, you know, here he is as an older gentleman, like taking on an amazing role like this in a amazing series and just knocking out of the park in his performance. Yeah. So it's awesome to see that, you know, like even, even the most veteran actors or people that are in there able to, have some awesome fun so for sure and then there was the frog thor which is like in the jar like hobbiting around or hopping around is like you in that transition scene when they go down into the uh little safe space i don't know what you want to call that yeah underground lair yep welcome to my underground lair sorry folks i'm not very entertaining my head is pounding i want to break it off right now but I'm going to power through what we have left. We'll get, through it. we'll get through it. So um, but yeah, that episode of Loki is great. And like, just knowing where they're ending at, where they're like, you see Loki as we know him discover a new power that he learns from Loki as she's teaching him, like, right. The two level there. And you know, they have this cosmic connection, like, and they're like, well, what are you going to do after this? Right. When he puts the blanket around her too, like they're really getting at like the, the love story piece there. And like, she's like, how do I know I can trust you? And, I think that's a very unique 
unique line, right? Because we're not used to getting a kind of a love story mixed in with all that. Like that was one of the elements I wasn't really expecting in there, but I'm quite enjoying. Yeah. I mean, it's just giving us a side of Loki that's like, you know, we've seen glimpses of over the years where he's tried to redeem himself. So he, where he's at, he's much more, he's much closer to the version of Loki that we saw die in uh, in an Infinity War. So. Mm-hmm. So um, that's pretty much it. Let us know what you thought of that episode of Loki, and we'll go from there. Because uh, Alec is struggling over here, so I don't want to. I don't want to hold him down too long. Yeah, I don't know. It's been kind of hurting all night, but it got really bad, probably because of the fucking headphones and the lights and shit too. Yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, <laughs> what do you want to move on to? You want to talk? Top five. This is top five. This is top five. I did top two five. of these little lists. Top five movie foods, but also bottom five movie foods. So I did best and worst, and my worst is just stuff that kind of grossed me out or is like nasty. <laughs> so my best is stuff that like I think of when I see and it always like makes me hungry. You salivate and you're like, oh yeah. Well, let's start with the best. All right. Uh, my number five is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. All the fucking candy in the candy beginning of that movie. I remember like watching that at Granny's or Grandma's house growing up. Candy store candy? No, the uh, like on the assembly line where like they're like pressing like the Hershey style kisses, candies, and all that. And like you're oh, seeing yeah. like chocolate coating, like that immediately like had me craving chocolate as a kid. So fucking love that. It's so beautiful to see too. My number five is the pizza that they order in a Goofy movie. Nice. That's a good call. It's animated pizza, but it is the only animated food that makes me want to eat pizza. And I only included pizza on this list once because you could have done it for Ninja Turtles because anytime I watch Ninja Turtles, I'm like, all right, let's get some pizza. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to something along those lines in my all list. Along, here. Along. Yep, that's another good call out there. Um, my number four, and I just, you know, this one was an easier one because this is all shit that just came to mind as I was thinking through. So number four is hook the imaginary food as they're teaching, uh, Robin Williams as Peter Pan, like find his imagination again. Like they go from like not seeing anything to like having this gigantic food fight that just looks like it's delicious. Hmm. My number four is the Wonka bar slash the scrum digitally umptious. Yes, good call. Those ones always intrigued me the most. Oh, I love, yeah, I love, I mean, there's just so many in Willy Wonka, but just like the beginning where you see all the candy being made, it's just like, oh my God, it just makes your brain go in overdrive, like, get me chocolate. Yeah, I can't watch that movie without a bunch of chocolate. Yep. So my number three is uh, Twister, the uh, food setup they have at Meg's. Now, obviously, I'm plant-based now, but, like, you watch that, and even just seeing, like, the homemade mashed potatoes and all that, like, it's just, like, nostalgic for, like, a good home-cooked meal, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Not on my list, but hey. My number three is uh, the food spread in the jail scene from Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a good call. Making Italian food from scratch and stuff. And uh, he's talking about how he sliced the garlic so thin you could see through it and stuff. You know, it was like paper. And it would just melt when he cooked it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just like a makes you want some real good homemade Italian food. So my number two is from the movie Sandlot. The s'mores in there is so fucking iconic. You just like yeah. every time you see that, and you're like, "Yes, give me, give me, give me, give me, I want it." Mm-hmm. Um, that's on my honorable mentions. My number two is somehow, ironically, the Chinese food in Lost Boys. It makes me want Chinese food, even though they're worms and maggots at some point. Still makes me want to eat Chinese food. Well, that's fair. I can respect that. My number one is specifically ninja turtles too because they go out of their way to show you like everybody like eating at this pizza shop that everyone's so fucking into and the pizza in there looks amazing so uh 
yeah, Ninja Turtles 2, the pizza they have in that movie. Just like the cheese pizza, like all, yeah, it just looks so fucking good. Yeah. Always make sure, like, yeah, I can use some pizza. Um, My number one is the, <laughs> it's a fucked up scene, but the food is what looks good. It's the strudel from Inglorious Bastards. Fuck it, yeah, that's, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, I could see that for sure. I've never even really eaten something that looks like that, but it looks so fucking good. And I just get so hungry every time I watch it that I stop focusing on the drama that's happening. I'm worried about the food. I'm like, where can I get that though? I'm sorry, beer. There's some good honorable mentions. And you might've noticed I'm a fat kid for sweets at heart because like my whole list besides the pizza is all like sweets and tasty things. Yeah. Uh, Jurassic Park, that spread when they get back in there. And they see all those desserts on that table before the raptors come in after they've been out, you know, running through the food. You know, they're just so excited to eat and they're so happy to see that. And like you just see them eating like all this junk food like kids would, and it's yeah. fucking amazing. Um, another another uh honorable mention, Uncle Buck, those giant fucking flapjacks he makes that are like he's flipping with a fucking snow shovel. That's oh, amazing. Yeah. So awesome. And as a kid, you're like, you have no idea. Like, you couldn't fucking do that. And like, those things would be so fucking burnt and destroyed. But, you know, suspend your imagination and it looks incredible. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll do the worst now. Yep. My number five is going to be the old 96er from the great outdoors. This is fucking wrong, man. Yeah, that's uh, I can I can see why. That's my number five is the pie vomiting scene from Stand By Me because those pies look good until like you see like the vomit going everywhere and you're just like you know it's fake but it just like is so unappetizing to see like that just splattering around everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what's your four? My number four is the exploding candy from Willy Wonka that uh, Mike TV eats. It's for your bullies. Almost blows his teeth out and shit. Yeah, that's awesome. My number four is the scene in Aliens because they're eating right before the he gets sick and the alien bursts out of his chest. And like, it's just so un, unappetizing to see like that chest burst scene that like you see that and like, as soon as I see them eating food, I immediately lose my appetite. And like, I don't even know what they're eating, but like, it's just unappealing because he gets sick and like, is yeah, it's gross. Hold well, on, I have to make a cut here. I will be right back. Uh, what were we at? <laughs> Uh, I did my number four, which was Alien, chest burst scene. My number three is the uh, shit pie from The Help. Oh, fuck. That is so brutal. Yeah, that is a nasty one. Yeah. But it's well-deserved, those fuck faces. Mm. Um, this is appearing on uh, my number three is uh, the noodles and rice from The Lost Boys because seeing the worms and maggots is unappetizing, despite conflicted by seeing the deliciousness of the noodles and rice. Yeah. But the maggots and uh, worms outweigh the goodness of the other scene. But it's very, it's great because it's automatic ones that just stays in your mind. My number two is the chilled monkey brains from Temple of Doom. Oh, that's fucking gnarly. Yeah, I used to hate that scene as a kid. Still do. Yeah, I haven't watched that in a while, and I'm sure it would gross me out. Uh, my number two is the old 96er from The Great Outdoors because all the gristle and fat, and he's like, hey, you think we can get dessert down and we can get a couple of the free Paul Bunyan shirts and hats for the kids? And, right. And then immediately he goes and vomits. Like, all mine are revolve around vomiting and, like, disgustingness. So yeah. I'm getting nauseous from this fucking migraine. No mention vomit. <laughs> my uh, uh -huh. number one is... uh. The movie Old Boy, he eats a live octopus at the bar, and it was live when he ate it. Oh, really? Little That's fucking one. Yeah, it's live, and he's fucking eating it and just tearing into it. It's fucking awful. But his character, I get why they put it in there, but it didn't have to be live. I don't know. This is a real yeah. thing to eat, though, for that. I don't know. It's fucked up. Rare yeah. dish, I guess, but, you know. So my number one is the turkey from Christmas Vacation. Because when that thing splits open and it's just all dried out and disgusting, you're just like, so fucking gross. But it's perfect. I mean, the scene sticks in your mind. 
So some honorable mentions for this list. Um, Van Wilder, the fucking dogs jizzing in the fucking donuts and everyone eating the jizz donuts. Like, it's so fucking disgusting. Um, same thing as Road Trip, the French toast going down the ass cheeks and, like, them eating that and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's some really there's some really raunchy ones out there. So there's a lot on that list, though. So. Could have gone with the Texas Chainsaw Human Barbecue. Yeah. Yeah, that would have gone. South oh. gas station. Mm-hmm. <sighs> So, dual top five so jump in the comments follow us on socials if you're not on there and let us know your top five foods that you enjoy and top five worst foods in movies video reviews with the frog brothers podcast black widow New. so we went to the theater last week saw the black widow uh opening right night on the friday night and uh quite enjoyed it uh mm-hmm. there's some things in there that just didn't weren't amazing but it's it's complicated as well i think there's a few things that really played into this movie changing what it what it could have been or what it originally started out as at least for me anyway i mean it wasn't bad by any means i still had a good time watching it i just might be conditioned to expect more because it's fucking marvel so it's hard to gauge how that actually is but um the breakout character is her sister obviously um obviously i mean red guardian was good too but but really red guardian with her and you know because i didn't know how what the backstory was going to be so that introduction the intro was very interesting with her in 1995 and shit um yeah it's funny that that period's getting uh, portrayed a lot in the past now it's it's interesting because it's so far away yet it feels so close just you know yeah it's fucked up (laughs) yeah but florence Florence Pugh as uh, Yelena is amazing. She did a great job in there. And her comedy and timing of her comedy was great. And I think that's one of the things I love the most about it. Like, even just her mocking, like, the Black Widow, like, the way she would come in and do shit, like, her landing and her posing and stuff. And then, like, when she does it later on, she, like, even talks shit on herself. She's like, ugh. Yeah. You know, just kind of, like, she just felt like someone, like, we would we would riff with if we were, like, in person with that type of person talking mm-hmm. shit. And, you know, having that kind of camaraderie and like ability to talk shit to each other so yeah. it kind of reminded me of you and me like yeah we're you know we're brothers but you know we still talk shit so right david harbour man i really liked him as the red guardian i thought he did great um yeah. i was i was a little disappointed though man they really hyped him up in the trailers and i thought we we're gonna see some more captain america style action out of his character which was a little disappointing to me just in in the grand scheme of things because i thought we'd see more of that and he was more character development with his own and then just kind of you know there yeah so yeah i get that he um uh it's hard to do a review like this when we didn't take notes on a first watch um especially since we didn't record it right after we watched it but I I like how it didn't do too much with the flashback stuff, but when it did flashback, it was all the way to her childhood. Not because I was worried that the flashbacks were going to be all about her training and stuff. And I was like, eh, you kind of I don't really need to see that. I mean, movies do that all the time, so I'm glad they didn't do that. Yeah, and I'm glad they didn't force that on us too much, even with the present day stuff, right? You know, they had enough glimpses of it just so you knew it was going on, but it wasn't like trying to have one of those particular new widows that you're focused on for the entire story so yeah and they made sure to like mention some current climate stuff like who's on the run and whatnot so you know where it takes place without having to worry about it too much as long as you know the marvel stuff yeah you know also i was really surprised with in this uh was rachel weiss that plays melina 
she did great too. Like her character was kind of a chameleon, right? Because uh, you didn't she, know for intent. Is she in the mummy? Um, I'm not hundred percent sure. Let me look real quick. Is that because she is? I mean, she just did a great job being that chameleon because like you don't know who who she's working for the whole time. And I loved how they kind of showed that family side of them like later on. So Yeah. And like that all really worked together. So Yeah, I think so. Yep, you're right. She was in the mummy. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just watched the first two mummy movies recently and well, the first one's really good. The second one's a but you know. The only thing that I found a little bit interesting for this, and and it's not necessarily a big deal, but it, it's just kind of Hollywood whitewashing to some degree, is that they didn't actually cast any like true Russians to play some of these characters, which I, they do such a good job in other departments. Sometimes it just seems like a no brainer for me to, to do some of that, just so there's some authenticity to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love, um, you know, David Harbour, but you know, he's digestible as that character. He does great as the Red Guardian, but at the same time, you're like, what, what would someone who's truly there be like and feel like? Would that make it feel more authentic? Mm -hmm. So just because some of the faking of the accents and things like that were a little strange, but they're also spies. So like you can kind of write it off and, and get through that, right? So because, it's one you know, of those things like because there's also, you know, like Sam Neill in Jurassic Park mm -hmm. or uh, Mel Gibson used to have an Australian accent. <laughs> just other people christian bale being batman you know yeah i did like how they you know they brought william uh hurt back so um you know we first saw him in hulk and then you know you know he's kind of popped up throughout the, the series in the whole mcu you know sporadically so mm -hmm. i like how they have some of this ongoing continuity there and some things so um the movie was overall fun right it's a it's a Marvel action flick. There's the heartfelt moments, but kind of what I was talking about and thinking about after watching this is after seeing some of these Disney Plus series where they're taking kind of a similar format, right? You know, they're giving us some of the backstory. They're kind of showing us what's going on. Would this have been a better TV series than movie? And it's not that by any means to say that, you know, Scarlett Johansson can't carry the movie or anything like that, or the movie shouldn't have been made, but it just felt like the story was rushed to get through certain things to get to the point which i guess kind of i found disappointing to some degree i don't know um i think it was just a little uh gray and by that i mean a little just the story was a little boring and i like i said i, I think that might just be because we're so used to big shit now like infinity war and like everything else is good at making big fucking shit and then you see a little smaller story where there's not a lot of superpowers you know i mean there's one super soldier yeah but i mean i love the spy aspect of these though so that's that's not a huge deal for me i mean i like the taskmaster character you know i, I thought that was done well um they do a good job of the the costume one that's great right you know it's really ambiguous you have no idea who's actually behind the mask and mm -hmm. so it's actually it's actually a pretty good reveal in there and someone who wasn't familiar with the taskmaster and, and some of these other characters, like it, it played out well for me. Yeah. But I just mean like from a series standpoint, the movie felt a little bit rushed in some of the flashback sequences, right? Because they made a big deal of us learning about how this family, you know, were, was a fake family and they kind of were aware of that, but they worked together as well. Didn't that might be broken? Okay. I'll try this, I guess. Alec is over here uh, dying on us, and he gets these migraines frequently. So, apologize if we're not as crazy over the top as we like to be usually. But hopefully, yeah. get to feeling. I have an arachnoid cyst in my head, and uh... oh man, these migraines yeah. suck. Yep, my eyeballs are hurting. My fucking jaw, my neck, my skull, my brain itself. Yeah, that's no fun. It's not going to kick in by the time we're done, but hey, at least no. I will not be dying sometime within the future. Ah, <sighs> well, that's that. What else? I mean, what what stood out to you in this movie? I guess I'd ask you. 
Yeah, I guess I kind of already said, you know, the her sister character, which I forget the name of, and uh Yelena. And I liked both of them. Yeah, I thought there was great. I really am looking forward to seeing uh Yelena come back. You know, it looks like she's gonna be in the Hawkeye TV series, is basically what I'm seeing. So yeah, based on that, which is fine. And this this fits in there very well within the mcu it's a shame that it came out when it did like you said because our expectations for the movies are so big after that i feel like the tv series have kind of grounded us back in and and made some of these stories more digestible because they're not having to be so over the top and like outdo the other stuff Mm -hmm. so it's part of me wants to see more of the background scene of like these kids knowing that they're spies but still like making the most of that family time right um and I think that's relatable to a lot of people, right? Because, you know, they say, you know, well, you've only got one family and you hear that kind of shit all the time. And if you got a shit family, you might have a shit family. So, um, you know, you adopt you, you adopt people in your life that make you feel like family. So whether or not they're real or not, it is what it is. So, but the, you know, they kind of played on that for Natasha, just kind of being in denial about that being important to her just because it was fleeting, right? It was fake. She knew that she was old enough to know that, but mm-hmm. You know, she admits to Elena that, you know, that was, you know, that was real for her too at some point. So I think that really kind of works out in telling that story. Looking forward though, I would love to see the Red Guardian come back and do some other things. I'm hoping to see some more of these characters pop up. So, yeah, I don't feel feel like we got the end of these stories, which is great. And then the whole Black Widow thing, right? You know, um, Natasha Romanoff is the Black Widow that everybody knows and loves, but I think there's some there's some opportunity for growth in here as well. So I think we're going to see some interesting stuff. Yeah. But we'll wrap that up for the new movie release review. Front row video reviews. We will move on. Now we turn to the real Ghostbusters. Diane, 11:30 a.m. February 24th. Bill Murray is the funniest man on the planet. Episode by episode. Twin Peaks. Season 2, Episode 10. Dispute Between Brothers. This is a good fucking episode, too. Like, the last one's one of my favorites out of the entire series so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, This one's a great follow-up. The only thing on this one, though, is there's a lot of subplots that are kind of being worked through in this, right? Just to kind of show you as, as you get. I mean, this is kind of the midpoint of the season here, right? There's this is where the series starts. A lot of people don't like the rest of season two here, or they like only oh, after this one. Of it. So, um, certain plots, yeah, yeah. Um, I like what Jay, uh, fucking Jay. Cooper is uh, saying to Sarah to make her feel better about Leland's death in the beginning. That yeah, I mean, that's, for, uh, that starts out with that heartbreak moment, you know, of like realizing that like Mrs. Palmer's there and basically she's lost her husband, she's lost her daughter now, and she decides that she doesn't want to take the drugs because she wants to be present for that. And, and part of that's just the resentfulness. I think that she knows she was drugged or understands that she was drugged at some point mm-hmm. and emotionally just doesn't want to have that keep happening now that you know everything's over from her perspective so right pretty interesting piece there the way that starts out and that's three days since the last episode is what it starts off with so they do show the ceiling fan shot from the beginning of uh the show that where it's like what sarah sees when she's yelling up to sarah ba- or uh, what sarah sees when she's yelling up to laura oh okay that's it all way that's neat. I guess I never caught that, so that's a good shout out. Um, the funeral food—it's always a weird thing to me. When I was a kid, I never understood why it's, there's always like banquets at some funerals and shit. It's like whatever. Yeah, the food- comfort food people eat when they're sad. It makes sense. Well, it, it was—it's a good strange mix, and which is like it felt very real life because there's like finger foods for people that just want to pick through something, eat something light, and then there's like really hearty foods that somebody might want to eat to like mend a broken heart so it's it's kind of like a, a crazy spread in there so yeah it worked well for that scene uh, cooper talks about going on vacation now the case is solved major briggs invites him on a night fishing trip yep 
Cooper tells Audrey about uh, Wyndham Merle and how he uh, got a woman killed. Yeah, and that's a big that's a big reveal for Dale, right? Because we haven't really explored that with him before, and like he explains, you know, you start to understand his philosophy on that, and she basically says, you know, well, I'll, I'll come after you later. I love you. Basically, is kind of what she's getting at. Yeah. So. Uh, Bobby gets ready to meet Ben. Uh, Catherine shows up in Harry's office, and she talks about more childhood memories, and that's the theme in this show: is childhood memories, nostalgia, and like childhood trauma as well. Mm -hmm. yeah she's like where did you disappear to and she's like well you know after this whole fire and i rescued that shelly girl she's you know I wandered through the woods until i saw the cabin that uh we stayed in when i was a kid and shit i ate some yeah. there he's like why'd you come back she's like i ran out of tuna yeah and it's like a plausible explanation right you know it's all bullshit but you know it's just one of those things that I mean, trauma does weird shit to people, right? And then re-experiencing trauma or addressing that in different ways and different things could trigger something like that. So it makes sense. Uh, Dick Tremaine goes to talk to Lucy. This is one of those side plots that's less interesting, but I like Lucy and Andy, so it works um, yes. for me at least. Yeah, I, I like how hate Dick Tremaine, so. Yeah, and he's he should just get on the ladder and fucking help her with those like light bulbs. And like, you know, it just shows you how worthless he is, but he's like, I went down and helped this like, you know, and he uses some derogatory term about somebody that's like basically a, a kid that's needs somebody from the big brothers, big sisters organization. And it's like, all right, this guy's a fucking scumbag. Yeah. So, I mean, it's important. Like, cause you're getting character development out of somebody like that. So, but we already didn't like him anyway. So Harry you know. gives Cooper uh, a green butt skunk. Yep, a little fishing, fishing made to learn, learn to make. And that was it's a real moment there. Like you really see their connection and how they work together and have respect for each other there in that moment. So, and he gives them a bookhouse boy patch. And I'm like, oh, I want that patch. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, how come those aren't popping up everywhere? They are. We're on Etsy and all that kind of shit. You can get them, eBay. I just haven't bought one yet. No. Uh, Special Agent Robert Hardy shows up. Mm hmm. Announces Cooper is suspended from the FBI without pay immediately. So that's usually, usually you're suspended with pay. Um, and, and most types of realistic situations, unless something real fucked up has happened. Yeah. Um, Bobby talks to Audrey outside Ben's office. She's curious as to what the fuck he's doing, lets him in her father's office. He gets kicked out. Um, he's trying to blackmail him, basically. Yeah. Well, let's step back though, because when they come in and make they make those accusations against no, Dale, they come right? back and do that later. Oh, okay, okay. I want to make sure. Yeah. No, Bobby and Audrey thing happens first. That's right. Okay. And then they go to the details, which is about Cooper crossing the border when he went to uh, One Eyed Jacks, the people that were killed there, as well as a drug transaction. So he's being accused of three different things, basically. Yeah, and it, 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 when when they come in and say that he's suspended without pay, though, like that felt like the end of an episode. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, that's that's the great thing about Lynch and like some of the writing style and the way this is done is that a lot of episodes would have ended with something like that, even in this series in itself. But then this one comes back, and you're like, oh, okay, we're we're gonna keep going, which I love because something like that sucks to wait for. And like, they immediately kind of get into it, which I appreciate like having that big plot announcement and then like having some resolution to it, like within the same episode. Yeah. Um, Nadine has some sort of tryouts for, I think gymnastics team or something. And she's uh, leading. Yeah. And she like what I will note is that there is a, uh, an actor from Weekend at Bernie's. He's in some other stuff too. I just can't remember off the top of my head. We saw him in something recently. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, but in Weekend at Bernie's, he's the guy who kills Bernie and is proof throughout the whole movie trying to kill the dead body of Bernie because he thinks he's still alive and he's unkillable and shit. You remember that guy? Oh, uh, yeah. I know he's one of the, the, like the cheerleading judges. He's the guy sitting there. Yeah. The other thing is, that gets so comical and over the top because like she goes and picks that other, the guy that's part of the cheerleading squad there and picks him up and just throws him. He's like, you can't like throw fucking 30 feet. 
Yeah, you see like a Nickelodeon style shot of like something that looks like it's out of salute your shorts. So you can't do that on television where this guy goes flying like from a low angle camera and it's just ridiculous. Right. Slow flying too. So it's, it's great. Leo moves a few feet or like inches or something. Yeah, really, yeah, really spooked Shelly at home. And even though he's still sitting there comatose, but she's basically like, look, I don't want this fucking money anymore. This sucks. This is miserable. We have no existence. Right. So see her kind of coming head to head with like wanting to get out of there. So um, Norma's mother is review uh, revealed to be the food reviewer and she gives her a bad review basically. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, you're overreacting total fucking. And she's like, fuck uh, you. I want you out of my life. Yeah. She's gaslighting her daughter the whole time. She's like, oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. You're overreacting. You're like, bitch, no. Like she does the thing you want to see someone do. And like people fail to do in real life is like, you can cut out toxic family members from your life if you need to. If someone's toxic and isn't fucking up your life, feel free to cut them out. Your health is more important than that. And I love seeing that back in a show like, you know, early 90s, seeing this kind of stuff on there, right? You know, that's stuff that's more common to see in shows now and like talked about and being addressed. But, you know, that's also, a pretty powerful moment. They mentioned in this episode, uh, Agent Robert Hardy mentions that the DEA is also coming in on this. There's a DEA agent in the next episode that is, uh, let's just say, one of my other favorite actors from another TV show in the 90s. Uh, yes, I know who you're talking about. So um, that's what finally appears. And then uh, this, this episode also has one of my favorite lines that I like to quote from Dale Cooper. There's nothing quite like urinating out in the open air. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that whole end sequence. But we got a few things to, you know, the whole Jean Renault thing kind of going on and, and getting that stuff figured out. It's kind of a small piece in there, but it's still significant because they're trying to get to that. Yeah. That's one of those plot lines. I don't give a shit about. That's well, the big, I guess I didn't take notes. The big piece on that though, is it's revealed that the Canadian and, um, you know, they're trying to, or, you know, one, I, the, the, I guess the new owner of one eye jacks or whatever, they're trying to set up the blackmail against Dale. Mm -hmm. Right. So I realized that that, that Canadian Mountie is actually working for Jean. So it's kind of like, oh, fuck. All right. Because at first you're like, why is he there? Like, does he not know? You're like, is he undercover there? And then you realize like, no, he's not undercover. He's under contract. Yeah. So. And then Josie briefly arrives and visits with uh, Harry, like in distress. And it looks like they make love. That's kind of vague. So another plot line that they open, they don't do anything with, but the, last two or three minutes of this like you said with that amazing line about dale pissing outside is amazing but major briggs man just him talking about men finding the evil and like how how you respond to evil like one way or the other and explains that yeah and man he's clearly like one of my favorite characters on here like that's one of those guys that should have had way more fucking screen time just because he always says like profound prolific shit and you're like man why aren't we getting more of this guy in there yeah he and that, he's great well, they're having that conversation about bob he's like you know is bob real and you know they just just discuss that and it's like oh yeah because this shows about the lore and all these crazy things and he feels like a character that like if you're you know and i need to get through the twin peaks books that i have on the shelf now but you know i would love to see his perspective even from like a in book format just to see what he knows and what he thinks about all this shit so. I recommend reading those well after we finish season two, you could probably read the first one. Yeah. But then read the second one after the third season. That's how you should read those. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was planning. So um, but the ending of this, right? You know, obviously Dale goes off in the woods to piss. And you know, um never to be seen from again. <laughs> major briggs is you know having this conversation he's like hey you can tell me that right when i get back hold that thought basically yeah and then next thing you know you see like this owl above the tree that cooper's pissing on obviously which we know represents bob we've seen that before right so it could just be an owl too that's the thing yeah. based on what we know with this that's that's kind of implied that there's something nefarious going on with this right so we see that and then obviously then we see the bright white lights and then fucking major briggs yells out for dale and disappears Dale goes running back and the episode ends and you're like what the fuck yeah captive tv too man could you imagine watching this when this came on like and talking about this shit around the water cooler because that'd been so fucking wild yeah. yeah like kevin smith said he used to uh 
watch it at RST video sometimes and shit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. It's a great episode. So like some really powerful stuff in season two, right? Because after season one, you're like, okay, so where do you kind of go from here? Well, after you solve Laura Palmer's murder case, where do you go from there? Especially knowing what you know now, like you have to. Oh well, yeah. And how do you make develop a, the story? How, yeah. And how do you keep Dale Cooper's character in there? Because normally you're just going to be like, okay, well you're done, but you know, it's, it's captivating. Well, yeah, it's all part of the process. <clears throat> Dale Cooper has other plans. For sure. So that's kind of going to wind us up here. You want to throw the, uh, the tune tunage going there, buddy? I suppose. Um... Yeah, turn that one down. That's... There we go. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode. I'm going to go pound my head into a concrete wall until I can't feel feelings anymore because my head hurts. Um, we do have some new stuff coming out this week. Uh, me. We've got a couple of special episodes coming out. We've got a uh, special episode. Yeah, so on Thursday we'll have the Cross Rip episode come out. And uh, Saturday we'll have the other one that we just recorded last night. These are my dinner guests, the Frog Brothers. Uh, next week, we'll also, on, I imagine, Thursday have some Crypticon coverage being released. The following Saturday, probably that uh, discussion we'll be having with Craig this week about ghost heads. So, lots of stuff coming up. Take care, follow us online, and we look forward to hopefully seeing some person at Crypticon. Peace out. These are my dinner guests. Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers. Frog Brothers. These are my dinner guests, Frog Brothers. Shut this off. Shut these all off.